all the films in the Halloween franchise, there are few that offer up quite such divergent opinions as 1982's Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. The obvious reason for this is that it's the odd one out, the movie without Michael Myers, and a lot of fans seem reluctant to even accept its place in the Halloween canon. As we've seen so far, both Halloween and Halloween 2 were enormous financial successes, enough to merit the creation of sequels to both films, even though it was necessary for John Carpenter to be more or less blackmailed into agreeing to make a sequel in the first place, and he declined the opportunity to direct, instead being replaced by a director for hire with little feel for the material. Halloween 2 had been a purely commercial endeavour, and had succeeded in becoming the second most lucrative horror movie of 1981 when it was released. However much John Carpenter had disliked Halloween 2, it had, from a purely monetary standpoint, been a success. When the question of a Halloween 3 arose, John Carpenter said yes, but only to enable him to make extra sure that the character of Michael Myers was well and truly dead, as per the finale of Halloween 2. To do so, he came up with the notion that the Halloween films could take on an anthology format and be redesigned as a series of unrelated horror films with a Halloween theme, much in the same way that the later Silent Night Deadly Night sequels did for Christmas. The first of these anthology installments was to be 1982's Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, directed by Tommy Lee Wallace, one of the most preeminent members of the Carpenter Hill filmmaking family that had come together in the previous decade. Season of the Witch couldn't be much less like the two Halloween movies that preceded it, a story of sinister Halloween masks that kill the children that wear them, business-suited killer robots, and with a devilishly charming corporate mastermind orchestrating all the chaos, who may or may not be a centuries-old sorcerer, and whose motives are, even when laid out, pretty bonkers. It's a movie that plays it dark, taking jabs at advertising, corporate culture, and the evils of big business, played out as an Invasion of the Body Snatcher style investigation narrative, with lasers and heads being pulled off. It doesn't take place in remotely the same world as Halloween 1 and 2, and audiences really didn't take to it at all. When Halloween 3 was released, it severely underperformed at the box office, which was one of the reasons why it took so long for Halloween 4 to be made. In fact, for half a decade, it looked like the Halloween franchise had died, and the cause of death was Halloween 3. Audiences didn't get Halloween 3 at all, they wanted the continuing adventures of Michael Myers, not this weird shit about kids with bugs exploding out of their faces, or so the story goes. Jump forward several decades, Halloween 3 has gained a loyal fan following. Over the years, fans have learned to love this movie in all its majesty and weirdness. Once again, we're seeing the same thing happen to Halloween 3 as happened to parts 1 and 2. Audiences are changing their perception of Halloween 3, no longer baffled by the lack of the shape. Suddenly, Halloween 3 fans have become a thing, and now Season of the Witch is looked upon as a quirky, beautifully shot 1980s horror classic, with a soundtrack that's probably one of the best of the entire decade. But whereas Halloween went from trash to masterpiece in a few months, Halloween 3's rehabilitation took a lot longer, because the movie itself is so strange and hard to pin down. So what happened? That's a good question, and I'm not entirely sure of the answer myself, but what I am aware of is the debate surrounding this particular film, because anybody you talk to on the subject of Halloween 3 will say one of two things about it without fail. Number one, Halloween 3's Season of the Witch wouldn't have flopped at the box office if it had just been a movie called Season of the Witch. People in 1982 just hated it because it didn't have Michael Myers in it. Or, number two, if this movie wasn't called Halloween 3, nobody would give a shit about it and it would just be a relatively obscure, weird 80s horror movie. Everyone I've seen write or talk or post about Halloween 3 takes one of these two arguments as their starting points. Broadly speaking, they represent two pretty obviously opposed viewpoints. Argument one is made by people who love Halloween 3 who can't work out why it flopped in 82, and argument two is made by people who don't like Halloween 3 and can't understand understand its subsequent reappraisal. Of course we're speaking generally here, but that's the gist of it. No other film in the franchise has quite such an interesting debate surrounding its very legitimacy, one centering on the semantics of its title, and in part that's because now, more so than ever, it's strange to think that Halloween 3 ever got made, because that's not how sequels work. The idea of abandoning everything that made parts 1 and 2 successful, in favour of a totally clean slate, is a move that demonstrates arguably the last gasp of genuine creativity in the entire franchise, and it's an idea that's pure John Carpenter. The failure of the Halloween as anthology notion demonstrates demonstrates just how hostile the 1980s were to genuine innovation, preferring instead easily marketable imitation and repetition. But we're not here to debate the merits of the film itself, that's a discussion for another time. We're here to try and get to the bottom of the Great Halloween 3 debate, which goes something like this. Either a non-Halloween film called Season of the Witch would have done better than Halloween 3, or that it would have been long since forgotten by the fans and never merited reappraisal. The question here is, which side of the argument has a better point, and what exactly does this debate tell us about the movie, the franchise, and the very idea of sequels? The 
problem with this argument is that it is based upon the assumption that audiences in 1982 didn't like Halloween 3 because Michael Myers was nowhere to be seen, and ignores any merits that the film may actually have. It's an argument coloured by hindsight because it relies upon the notion that franchise identity constitutes an ability to easily mass-produce homogenous product for an essentially undiscerning audience, hostile to nuance or originality of any kind. However, John Kenneth Muir refutes this, pointing to the fact that audiences were also extremely hostile towards later franchise entries Halloween 6 and Halloween Resurrection, both of which did feature Michael Myers, as well as being bad movies. Trick or treat, motherfucker. <laughs> Muir believes that Halloween 3's faults lie not so much in its titling, but in its excessively illogical script. He believes Halloween 3 didn't fail because of the lack of familiarity, but because Halloween 3 just wasn't a good movie. That's fair enough, but plenty of the people making the claim that it was the Halloween 3 brand that led to Season of the Witch's downfall do so from a position of love for the movie itself. These are the viewers that understand full well the history of Halloween 3, rather than the less informed audiences of 1982. Let's play this out then. In 1982, a movie is released featuring a lot of the same behind-the-scenes talent responsible for the two Halloween movies called Season of the Witch. Without the Halloween 3 label, it would have received a lot less publicity, there would have been no Fangoria front covers for Season of the Witch, and there would probably have been a lot less general interest in the movie as a whole. As a fan, it's easy to point out Tommy Lee Wallace's place as production designer and editor of the original Halloween, but casual audiences, the kind that decide a movie's box office success, would have been none the wiser. Viewers would have been committing to an entirely original movie without any prior expectations. I don't think that anybody went into Halloween 3 expecting Michael Myers, then left angry that he never showed up, and then told their friends to stay away. More than likely, there would have been enough buzz around the film for viewers to know what they were getting into, and certainly, this disparity wouldn't be enough to account for the movie's poor box office, because whatever our ultimate opinion of Halloween 3, the bottom line is that it didn't make anywhere near as much as the first two movies did. So what was keeping people away? I think there are three major factors responsible for this. Confusion, competition, and cynicism. Confusion is pretty straightforward. Audiences just didn't know what to expect from Halloween 3. The title was misleading, and things weren't helped by Tommy Lee Wallace's notion that the Halloween 3 of the title was a reference to the three silver shamrock masks used in the film, rather than being a designator of the movie's sequel status. Even now, there's a lot more to explain about Halloween 3 than there is any other film in the franchise, and that baggage was confusing to viewers even once they'd fully accepted that they weren't going to be watching another Michael Myers movie. It wasn't the lack of Michael Myers that hurt the movie, but the fact that so much of the promotional material around the film was concentrated on conveying the notion that this was a standalone movie and a new direction for the series, rather than on hyping the movie itself, and for an average viewer, it probably didn't help the movie any. Okay, so Michael Myers wasn't going to be coming back, so what did we have instead? Halloween masks? Guys in suits? The problem here wasn't so much that Halloween 3 wasn't an attractive prospect, but that it wasn't an easy movie to sell. The slasher movie boom of the early 1980s showed that menacing guys with knives sold tickets. Other than that, advertising was the thing, as Season of the Witch shows us so well. You needed something to get people to watch. Its form is revealed. What is it? Its focus is clear. <laughs> Poltergeist. The highest grossing horror movie of 1982 was Poltergeist, which had a fantastic trailer, big name recognition with Steven Spielberg's name featured prominently in advertising, and a simple, easily saleable premise. As someone who much prefers Halloween 3 to Poltergeist, you have to admit, the trailer we got for Halloween 3 is, well, mystifying at best. A jumbled, incoherent mess that gives nothing away, despite featuring snippets of climactic moments and even the very last shot of the movie itself. of the witch, the night no one comes home. For a movie that's built on an investigation of a mystery, with its characters being kept in the dark for at least the first hour of H3, it must have been difficult determining exactly what kind of a film Halloween 3 actually was. 
Secondly, we come to competition. Halloween 3 hadn't sold itself well, and that's a problem when you're trying to stand out in a crowd, even when you've got a movie that's as unique as Season of the Witch. There were plenty of great horror movies in 1982 that it had to contend with, but also this was the beginning of the VHS era, where movies were losing out to home video viewers. For a film to succeed at the box office in 1982, it needed to market itself well, which Halloween 3 didn't do at all. The surest sign that cinema was starting to feel the pressure of competition for the small screen was the brief resurgence of 3D, the kind of gimmick that drew in crowds with its promise of a big screen exclusive experience, and the 3D craze of the early 1980s was arguably responsible for catapulting fan favourite Friday the 13th Part 3 to respectable box office numbers. That's because initially, at least, the Friday the 13th movies were shamelessly commercial enterprises, designed to sell tickets, whereas the Halloween films always cared about the craft that went into their productions, which is one of the reasons that there was never a Halloween 3D. In a crowded marketplace full of gimmicks, and with decades of movies to contend with being released on VHS, a confusing little movie like Halloween 3 just didn't stand out, whatever its title. Finally, we come to cynicism. Halloween 3 is a cynical film in that it has a cynical, grungy outlook, not that it was cynically made. Quite the opposite, in fact. In the 1970s, cynicism was everywhere, especially in the horror genre. Even big-budget mainstream studio pictures were adopting a cynical, jaded approach to their storytelling. By the end of the decade, however, movies had begun to appropriate a more upbeat, crowd-pleasing tone of the kind found in Rocky, Superman, Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and of course, 1982's highest-grossing film, E.T. That's not to say that there weren't a great deal of downbeat films made in the early 80s, but rather that those that did well at the box office tended to be more optimistic and hopeful, whereas Halloween 3 was a film that wasn't afraid to kill children, and ended in a pessimistic fashion as well as being overtly critical of a multitude of cynical 1980s business practices such as advertising, mass marketing and commercialisation. In many ways, Halloween 3 was an anti-commercial film, and that would doubtless have hampered its chances of enjoying success away from the Halloween stable, however valid its claims or how gleefully it embraced taboo subjects. It wasn't a mainstream horror movie that could play to the crowds in the same way that Halloween's 1 and 2 did. The main advantage of the Halloween name for Season of the Witch is, of course, that it has allowed the film to play to a much larger audience, and enabled its subsequent reappraisal by avid franchise bingers. Would we still be coming back to Season of the Witch after nearly 40 years if it didn't slot into the juggernaut of the Halloween franchise? Probably not, but the best thing about this movie still being what it is, is that it lets us see that there is more to the genre than formulaic slashers, that however cynically made the later sequels might have been, this was a film made with passion and enthusiasm for the most part, let down only by a throw everything at the wall and see what sticks script. Everyone is at the top of their game in Halloween 3, and were it not for the fact that this was a genuine attempt at doing something new, giving the audience a new experience rather than the same old thing, then it might well never have even got made in the first place, which would have been pretty tragic. I don't honestly think that, without the Halloween franchise banner, the Carpenter filmmaking family would have ever greenlit a standalone season of the Witch movie. The impetus was to take the profitable Halloween brand and use it to shepherd in a new line of Halloween-themed movies, and season of the Witch was extrapolated from that central conceit. If the Halloween name had been dispensed with, then the urge to make a seasonal horror movie would have gone with it too. I don't buy that whole argument. Season of the Witch is, incontrovertibly, a Halloween movie. Which takes us into the second argument here in the Great Halloween 3 debate. Now this is an argument made by people who don't really like Halloween 3, who believe that the Halloween franchise is the continuing adventures of Michael Myers, and find the inclusion of this particular film in the canon to be deeply confusing, a complete misstep that should be banished from memory. This seems kind of unfair to whatever positive qualities Halloween 3 has to offer, so let's get into this a bit deeper. If Season of the Witch had been released without the Halloween 3 tagline, we've already established that its audience would have been smaller. Audiences were drawn to ideas as much as they were to behind-the-scenes talent. But one thing that does sell is good movies. However, as we saw with regards to Halloween 2, the early 1980s, now considered a goldmine for horror fans, were a period in which critics were extremely hostile to the genre as a whole. There was never going to be a fun, gory horror movie about mass child murder that got the thumbs up from critics, so Halloween 3's chances at making a killing at the box office were greatly reduced, although it doubtless would have played to a smaller, more appreciative audience. The issue here with this argument is that there are plenty of great movies made in the 80s, a wealth of memorable and enjoyable films that are still fondly remembered by those that saw them to this day. However, the fact that Season of the Witch is part of the Halloween franchise has elevated it above a lot of its contemporaries, opening up to far more scrutiny and criticism. The point here isn't necessarily that Halloween 3 is a bad movie, but that it doesn't stand up when viewed as part of an 11 plus film saga that's endured for over 40 years. The iconography and mythology of the Halloween franchise has attracted new fans with each passing generation, and that mythology centres around the 
Michael Myers' character. Fans aren't discovering the series through Halloween 3, but instead are confronted with it when they finally get to the point of obsessiveness that dictates that they watch every single movie in the franchise, and invariably that ends up making Halloween 3 feel like a bit of an outsider, an obvious cuckoo in the nest. It's one of the great curses, especially for horror fans, to feel the need to compare and contrast the various installments of a franchise, which is why franchise rankings are such a common thing. You can compare the various episodes of the Michael Myers saga, because they all do essentially the same thing. They all tell a slight variation on the same story, and it's that familiarity that draws in lifelong fans. That's not to say that fans are afraid of change or originality, but the more that a particular filmmaker decides to mess with the pieces on the board, the harder they have to work to convince the diehards that they're disregarding the formula for the right reasons, rather than coming in and deliberately throwing out the baby with the bathwater because they don't understand the core identity of the franchise. Halloween 3 faces the ire of fans because it contains none of the elements that they signed up to the franchise for in the first place. And and yet, Halloween 3 still endures, it still creeps up on new audiences regularly, and no matter what detractors say, it has not been forgotten. It lives on however awkwardly it fits in, and it's a more popular film than ever now. Would it be getting the VIP treatment from fans now if it had been a standalone movie called Season of the Witch? Of course not. But then, as we've already seen, such a movie just would never have existed in the first place. But this is an argument made from hindsight, from the lofty peaks of 40 years of Michael Myers' mayhem. We probably wouldn't have still been talking about this particular film if it wasn't named Halloween 3, but the most enduring thing about this instalment is that it encourages us to dig deeper and to ask the question why. The one thing that it's impossible to be about Halloween 3 is complacent. You would never marathon the Halloween films without some kind of debate arising about this movie. Chances are, the first time all of us learned about Halloween 3, we needed to try and understand just what the filmmakers were doing, why they had made such a huge mistake by leaving out Michael Myers, but by the second or third time you watch Halloween 3, you start to wonder about what would have happened if this experiment had been successful. Bit by bit, you begin to contextualise this weird blip in the saga, and with that knowledge comes a greater understanding of exactly what was happening at this period in time. Halloween 3 came at a time before the 80s gave way to a flood of sequels and franchises, when the ideals of genuine filmmaking craft took precedence over by the numbers repetition, but Halloween 3's failure at the box office in 1982 suggests that this particular battle was already lost. Let's not forget that this is a movie in which John Carpenter's Halloween is showing on television, sponsored by Silver Shamrock itself. For a lover of cinema like John Carpenter, you can imagine how frustrating it must have been to have his own beautifully shot Panavision masterpiece crammed onto a tiny 1980s television screen, in front of a bored audience being constantly interrupted by wave after wave of increasingly assertive advertising. Here we just go one step further. The adverts jammed into the broadcast of Halloween are sinister Trojan horses, carrying with them destructive messages for the nation's youth, who seem more interested in watching the adverts than they do the movie itself. Halloween 3 is a film about the evils of mindless corporate consumerism in the most John Carpenter way possible. That it has so many defenders nearly 40 years later is a testament to the broad-mindedness of fans over the years, and those that condemn Halloween 3 out of hand can only be the sort of dogmatic consumers that aren't willing to take a walk on the wild side, the kind that accept no deviation in their entertainment and need constant hand-holding to be sure that they know what they're getting themselves in for. The sort of people, in fact, that would want nothing but silver shamrock masks, and would accept no substitute no matter how well made it may be. To me, the worst sin you can commit is to love all the Halloween films but to have never even seen Halloween 3 because you doubt its legitimacy. Watch Halloween 3 and by all means laugh at how ludicrous it is, because I'm not saying that it's an amazing film. That isn't the legacy of Halloween 3 at all. It's a movie about an evil billionaire toy maker stealing a bit of Stonehenge so he can make children's heads explode by beaming a signal through their 1980s television sets. It's not even remotely the kind of thing you can take the intellectual high ground to defend, but it's sure as hell unique and nobody involved in the making of Halloween 3 seems cynical or complacent about what they were making. The real lesson of learned from Halloween 3 is that it's not a great film, but it is a film, a unique cinematic construct, and it reminds us that each and every one of the Halloween movies is a film too, and that we need to look upon them as such and consider each of them as separate distinct entities, not as one great homogenous lump. As much as we might love the idea of a great big 11 movie saga, the original Halloween was a movie made as a genuine piece of cinema, not as an easily digestible piece of pop culture junk food, and we need to stop thinking of the sequels as being nothing less than imitations of that original. In fact, every single sequel ever made should aspired to have as much of a sense of its own identity as Halloween 3 does. Which sounds crazy, but I genuinely think that. The hostility towards Halloween 3 in 1982 may be excusable, because viewers weren't aware of what they were going into, but we've got no excuse now to dismiss Halloween 3 out of hand, because we've got easy access to the behind the scenes details, and because the history of this particular film is now so well known to us all. The Halloween 3 debate will continue on and on for as long as new fans continue to flock to the Halloween franchise, because whatever games of what if we might choose to play, Season of the Witch will always remain a part of the 
the Halloween series. Just make sure that if you're going to love or hate Season of the Witch, do it for the right reasons, not just because it's different. Love it because it was made for all the right reasons by people who care and not by cynics trying to make an easy buck from low effort repetition. And hate it because of that fucking silver shamrock jingle.